Genetic mapping is central to genomic science because it provides an organizational framework for the genome. The value of genetic markers is enhanced if their location in the genome is known, that is, their map position on a specific chromosome is known. In Module 8, we will introduce the major steps in constructing a genetic map, show some examples of genetic maps in forest trees, and discuss how they are used. In coming modules, it will become apparent that genetic maps play a key role in efforts to dissect complex traits into their component genetic parts. Or to state it differently, maps can help in identifying the number, location, and potential source of discrete genetic units, or genes, that affect specific traits of interest. Let's begin our discussion of maps with an analogy, using a set of more traditional maps as examples. How are maps used? Many of us routinely use geographic-based maps for different purposes. Perhaps we want to know which roads to follow to reach our destination. We'll use maps that highlight highways and cities. Or perhaps we're not familiar with the location of mountains, coastal plains, river drainages, or other physical features. Maps that illustrate terrain features serve this function. Satellite maps give us an entirely different perspective of the same region. Clearly, we use different maps for different purposes, and different kinds of maps provide different kinds of information. Maps are highly specialized tools, and there is no one map that provides all the information one may need. Just as there are different kinds of maps with geographic, demographic, or climatic information, there are also different kinds of maps with genetic information, each with its own application. For instance, there are cy cytological maps, physical maps, DNA sequence maps, linkage maps, and as we shall see later, QTL are quantitative trait locus maps. We even speak of association mapping, though certainly one can use QTL and association for marker-assisted selection without maps. Our focus in this module is on genetic mapping. Genetic mapping, or perhaps more appropriately titled linkage mapping, is a process by which one can arrange segregating loci relative to each other in proper order and genetic distance from one another. This is done by identifying the number of recombination or crossing over events that occur between markers during a production of gametes. Generally speaking, the, the further apart two markers are physically on a chromosome, the higher recombination frequency that is, the greater the number of crossover events between the markers. Though proportional, the relationship between physical and genetic distance is not completely linear. This is true for a few reasons. One, as recombination frequency approaches 50%, estimation errors increase. And two, the amount of recombination between any two equidistant markers may vary significantly throughout the genome. Chromosomal events, such as translocation, for instance, may lead to a virtual lack of recombination events for a given region of the genome. Linkage between loci confers the power to predict the allelic state of one locus based on the allelic state of the other locus, a powerful tool. There are three major steps to constructing a genetic map, as noted in this slide. We will address all these points, to one degree or another, and give some simple examples from forest trees. But before we embark on mapping populations, let us briefly review the mechanics of recombination. The purpose of this slide is to review the process of meiosis, which results in gametogenesis. Shown here are a pair of hypothetical chromosomes illustrating the many steps in the process that leads from diploid parent cells to a set of gametes with a single set of chromosomes, or haploid cells. Along the way, at prophase 1, chromosomal pairs are arranged in close contact after they have replicated. 
One or both pairs of sister chromatids may recombine at one or more points along the chromosome at that time. The resultant tetrad of gametes that emanated from that original cell will have parental chromosomes only if no crossing over, or chiasma, has occurred, or both parental and recombinant chromosomes if crossing over has occurred. This slide illustrates how chromosomal configurations in the meiotic products of 50 mother cells are used to calculate recombination frequency. Keep in mind that markers, identified here as A and B, both uppercase and lowercase, are used to identify whether a meiotic event is designated parental or recombinant. In this example, 49 mother cells go through reduction division without a crossover event, result, which results in 98 large A large B and 98 small a small b parental chromosomes. A single cell encounters a crossover that yields four gametes, each with a different chromosome type, namely large a large b, large a small b, small a large b, and small a small b, of which the middle two are recombinant. The recombination frequency is calculated as the total number of recombinant products, 2 in this case, divided by the total number of products or gametes, which is 200. The recombination frequency thus equals 2 divided by 200, or 1%. Recombination frequency of 1% may also be called 1 map unit, or 1 centimorgan. Therefore, 1% recombination means that one meiotic cell in 50 has a crossover in the region between the genes. Stated differently, a centimorgan may be defined as a length of chromosome in which an average of 0.01 crossover events occurs per generation. One centimorgan represents, on average, a physical distance of about 1 million base pairs in humans. For conifers, the physical distance for one centimorgan is likely 10 times or more that of humans. Keep this in mind in future discussions on markers and QTLs. A mapping function is the relation between genetic map distance, shown here in Morgans, rather than centimorgans, as indicated in the figure, across an interval in the observed frequency of recombination. Two common mapping functions, named after their developers, Haldane and Kosambi, differ in how they account for genetic interference. Interference is believed to be related to the physical process of recombination, in which one chromosome exchange, or chiasma, inhibits the likelihood of another in an adjacent region. Note that recombination frequency does not exceed 0.49 in this figure. Why might this be? When the probability of two markers segregating together reaches 50%, the markers are no longer considered linked. This is true whether they exist a long way apart on a single chromosome or on separate chromosomes. There are two general types of mapping populations commonly used in forest trees, the haploid map and the full sib pedigree map. For conifers, either map type is feasible due, due to the unique seed biology feature of haploid megagametophytic tissue surrounding the embryo. The paternal, that is, the maternal allele expressed in the haploid nutritive tissues is the same as that expressed in the embryo. For conifer trees that are heterozygous for a given locus, alternative alleles will segregate one-to-one -one in the megagametophytic tissue of an array of seed. Linkage between two or more heterozygous loci in the same tree is easily tested on a pairwise basis, and linked loci subsequently mapped. Full sib pedigree mapping populations come in multiple forms, each of which will be discussed briefly along with the concepts of linkage phase and marker informativeness.
The development of allozyme markers in forest trees resulted in a number of haploid megagametophyte linkage maps being created. The concept of linkage can be illustrated using the two locus example observed in pitch pine seed as shown in this slide. Two heterozygous loci, identified here as GOT1 and GPI2, each possessed a pair of alleles labeled here as F for fast and S for slow. If the loci were not linked, the expectation for the frequency of all pairwise combination of alleles would be equal. That is, each should occur 25% of the time. In a total sample of 160 seed, therefore, we, there should be 40 with the F allele at both the large F allele at both loci, 40 with the FS genotype, etc. In fact, what was observed was an abundance of FF and SS genotypes. A chi-squared test reveals that the distribution deviates significantly from expectation, suggesting the loci were linked. The recombination frequency was calculated to be 0.043. Indeed, the markers were located only 4.3 centimorgans apart. This was the first published example of linkage between two loci and conifers. By identifying the parental and recombinant chromosomes, we may also infer the linkage phase of the markers. We would say the two markers are in coupling, that is, FF and SS parental chromosomes. The alternative arrangement is called repulsion. Linkage phase is important to know and simplifies mapping in pedigree crosses. A number of simple genetic maps were ultimately built in the late 70s and early 80s based on megagametophyte populations and allozyme markers. Two of these are noted here and are useful for illustrating a few points. First, it is obvious from these maps that marker density is low. Only five linkage groups were identified in these two pine species of the possible 12 chromosomes they each have. Generally speaking, the more markers mapped, the better, though the purpose of the map will dictate the appropriate number. Another observation here is that the two maps have many similarities. Linkages between the same loci with similar order and distance between them occurred in two distinct species. This was the first real evidence of conserved genomes in conifers and suggested that genes related by descent occur in similar order on multiple linkage groups across species boundaries, something called syntony. Subsequent maps using similar populations were built using other marker types like rapids, randomly am amplified polymorphic DNA, and AFLPs, our amplified fragment length polymorphisms, both of which could be generated in large numbers quickly and inexpensively. Map density with these markers was vastly increased, greatly improving our estimates of genome size. Both rapids and AFLPs are dominant markers. That is, only one allele may be detected, the other appearing as a null. The megagametophyte tissue is ideal for these markers because it is haploid and both alleles can be determined, i.e. a marker is either present or absent. These markers are not as useful in diploid crosses where the null allele is often not detectable. We will discuss this further in the next section on full sib crosses. Let's start discussion of mapping with full sib pedigrees with a back cross or BC population because they are relatively easy to interpret. You may have heard the term test cross in an introductory genetics course. A test cross is a special kind of back cross. The back cross approach is predicated on the idea that two parents are homozygous for alternative alleles at each of many loci such as often the case when dealing with inbred lines as found in corn breeding, but it is less effective in outcrossing species. If you had a very large number of markers to use, such as SNPs, you may still find mappable markers, but it would not be an efficient system. As we saw with Mendel's peas, which incidentally also tolerate inbreeding well, 
Alleles segregate in the F2 generation. In theory, all F1 offspring should be heterozygous at all markers at which parents were homozygous for alternative alleles, as seen in this slide. The mating of an F1 individual with one of the parental lines or individuals results in progeny called the back cross 1 or BC1. These progeny should segregate for heterozygous loci. The genotype of each backcross offspring can be readily interpreted as either parental or recombinant. This is good. But remember, we are using offspring genotypes to tell us about the recombination event from the parents. The recurrent parent, shown here as P2, is homozygous for both markers A and B. Hence, no recombination in P2 can be observed. In other words, only meioses from the F1 parent are informative. Another way of looking at this is that chromosomes from the P2 parent are needed only to enable the backcross 1 progeny to be viable. They provide no additional information on recombination. Not only does this figure illustrate the marker configuration of progeny from a backcross mating, it also shows the expected frequency of each gamete type based on R or RF, the recombination frequency, between the markers. Finally, note that if R is equal to 0 0.5, meaning the markers are unlinked, then the frequency of each gamete type is one quarter, segregating as 1 to 1 to 1 to 1. The F2 mapping population differs from the back cross in that two F1 offspring are used as parents of the F2 progeny. This approach works in many cases, but specifically in cases where the organism is able to tolerate either one, some level of inbreeding, or two, interspecific crosses like poplar, eucalyptus, or oak. The major distinction between the F2 and the back cross is that in the F2 we are tracking recombination in both parents simultaneously. This is more inf efficient in terms of informative meioses since each offspring reflects two meiotic events but can also lead to other challenges, namely ambiguous phase. This becomes an issue if in fact the grandparents are not homozygous for alternative alleles. Consider what F1 genotypes you might have if for instance P1 and P2 were both genotype big A big Q, little a little Q. Finally, look closely at the recombinant genotypes shown here. Do they represent all possible recombinant genotypes? In fact, the recombinants shown are only those that would occur if one F1 parent at a time had a recombinant event. If both do, there would be additional genotypic classes. How many more? The intercross mapping population involves four grandparents and may potentially produce many more genotypic classes. With marker types that possess many alleles, such as SSRs, RFLPs, or allozymes, it is possible to have the unusual condition shown here where all four grandparents are homozygous for different alleles, as implied by color. It is more likely, of course, that grandparents will share some alleles in common, and the F1 parents might also share alleles. The actual haplotypes of the F1 parents will dictate how informative the marker is for mapping. What do we mean by that? Take the case shown in this slide. Markers that had this arrangement would be fully informative. In the F2 progeny, you would know exactly where each allele came from in every individual, and you could extract information for both the male and female meioses. Now imagine that one F1 parent's genotype was blue slash blue, and the other green slash yellow. The marker would be uniparentally informative. What if both F1 parents have the same genotype, say blue slash green? One could not distinguish in the F2 progeny 
which parental meiosis resulted in the haplotype observed. This marker configuration would be uninformative. The intercross has been used in conifers that do not tolerate inbreeding, and it is particularly effective for subsequently mapping quantitative trait loci if the grandparents are chosen carefully with respect to phenotypic traits. The number of individual progeny required to construct a genetic map is largely dependent upon the objectives you seek to meet. It is also intimately intertwined with how many markers you will be using and how much money you have to spend on the map. The overriding question one must answer is what resolution of mapping is necessary to meet your objectives. For instance, if you wish to detect a recombination frequency of 0.05, or five centimorgans between two markers, one would need to genotype a minimum of 20 individuals with the expectation of seeing one crossover event. There is a good chance that no crossover event would occur with such a small sample size. Your interpretation of the data would be that the two markers reside on top of one another. The more meiosis captured, the more precise and fine resolution the map will have. For questions of macrocentony, like comparing the number of linkage groups and whether gene groupings occur in the same manner in different taxa, a modest number of individuals, say 75 to 100, 100, will suffice. For maps that will be used to locate quantitative trait loci and help resolve the genetic architecture of complex traits, it is desirable to have many more progeny on the order of 300 to 500 or more. For applications such as map-based cloning, or map-based sequence alignment, thousands of progeny would be desirable. Finally, the size of population you use may depend on how much money you have to conduct the work. We conclude this brief section on mapping populations by re reiterating a few relevant points. Genetic mapping of parents is done by viewing the genotype of the progeny of a cross from those parents. Some cross types, like the back cross, provide mapping data on one parent only. Other cross types, like the F2 and intercross, provide information on meiotic events occurring in both parents. However, any given marker may be informative for only one parent at a time. A fully informative marker tells us something about both parents. Maps are constructed for one parent at a time. If a sufficient number of common markers exist for the two parents, a sex average map may be constructed that has more markers than either of the individual maps. Similarly, with common markers, maps from two or more crosses may be integrated. This is all done with one of many software programs available. Some of the more common linkage software available for use in forest trees are MapMaker and JoinMap, though MapMaker is best suited to applications using megagametophyte data. JoinMap is best suited for dealing with the more complicated pedigree crosses described in earlier slides. A quick internet search will reveal literally hundreds, as many as 500, of genetic analysis software, many of which handle linkage and mapping. Mapping software has two or three tasks, depending on how they are defined. They first calculate the recombination frequency between every pairwise combination of markers. Those markers that exhibit significant linkages are grouped. Note that these groups effectively represent linkage groups or chromosomes. Not all markers in a group need to be linked to all other markers in the group. Finally, the spatial relationship between markers, or the marker order, is determined. Here, a rather simplistic example is given that illustrates the ordering process. One could extend this logic to explain why all markers in a group need not be linked to each other. Imagine another marker called G that is shown to have a rel recombination frequency equal to 0 0.2, or 20 centimorgans, from E. 0.4 RF, or 40 centimorgans, 
from marker F, but shows a recombination frequency of 0 0.5 with marker D. As with many things in genomics, or science in general, the answers to the questions posed here are dependent on many parameters and conditions. Twenty years ago, the purpose of building a genetic map was first and foremost primarily a demonstration of proof of concept. Can we do this for forest trees? The maps were not always intended for downstream applications. Consequently, maps were often based on the most expedient populations, say haploid megametophytes, and markers, like rapids and AFLPs. These marker types were plentiful and inexpensive, readily obtained, but were dominant recessive in nature. That means that they were typically biallelic, being either present or absent. With haploid megametophyte tissue, both alleles could be detected, but with diploid materials, these markers would be useless, because one could not differentiate between homozygous present and heterozygous present absence. The preferred marker type for most applications is codominant. That is, all allelic forms are detectable. For maps that will ultimately be used to map QTLs, or quantitative trait loci, and where intercross populations will be used, markers with multiple alleles are desirable. But biallelic codominant systems will work just fine. For applications that require high density maps, large numbers of markers, say a thousand or more, are needed, and for maps that only need a framework of markers for the genome, 75 to 100 markers may be satisfactory. Applications that would require a lot of markers would be, one, the construction of a genetic map that would be used to integrate genetic and physical maps, and two, study of microsynteny across taxa. A framework map would suffice for exploratory QTO mapping. Factors that may influence your marker choice and the number of them you, you will use include your budget and which genotyping platforms exist for alternatives. The answers to the questions must be based on this multi-dimensional decision tree and they may change over time as new and improved technologies and markers become available. We have talked a lot about the process of making genetic maps. Now let's look at a few. We have chosen a few examples just to reflect a bit on the rapidly changing technology landscape. To begin, we draw from work that, that was conducted at the Institute of Forest Genetics in the mid-1990s. Marker data was collected from a three-generation intercross using restriction fragment length polymorphisms, or RFLP markers, that were visualized in southern blots using radioactive tracer chemicals. The dots were here represent fragments of different sizes that were separated electrophoretically in a gel. In this example, grandparents and parents are shown in figure A, and 24 progeny are shown in figure B. This is an example of a fully informative markers that is, the mother and father are each heterozygous for a different set of alleles. Two, three in one parent and one, four in the other. To be sure, alleles one and two are very nearly alike and reading the plate takes some interpretation skills. Still, these data reveal independent segregation of this marker in each parent. That is, information is obtained for creating two maps, one for the father and one for the mother. The map shown here was constructed in an iterative process that began with the screening of hundreds of markers on a small 48 mapping population as described in the previous slide. Eventually, 217 markers were analyzed for 192 progeny. Of these, 141 markers eventually appeared on the map. 33 markers were fully informative. 49 were paternally informative, and 58 were maternally informative. Individual parental maps were built, and a sex average map was subsequently developed. 
All maps were made with Join Map software. Many things can be observed on this map, but we will point out just a few. The first thing we notice is that there are 17 distinct linkage groups shown here, four more than the 13 chromosomes Douglas fir is known to have. Clearly, some of the groups above represent different segments of the same linkage groups, but we have too few markers in the right places to tie those groups together. We can also observe here the rather uneven distribution of markers on the linkage groups. This may be due to our marker selection not covering the genome uniformly, or it may be a reflection of genome organization, or both. The total map length as shown in this map is around 1,062 centimorgans, substantially less than observed in subsequent constructions where we think the map may be 2,000 to 2,500 centimorgans in length. Maps of similar marker density or greater have now been created for dozens of tree species, many of which may be seen at the link on the slide. The addition of sequence-based markers like SNPs for which relatively fast and inexpensive genotyping platforms exist, make high-density maps much easier to obtain. Base calls, such as shown in the trace files at the left in this slide, show each base in a different color. Three traces of the same area are shown for three different individuals. The top and bottom traces are homozygous for each base position, while the center trace shows a heterozygote for a yellow and green base combination. The map data that come from high-throughput marker genotyping are profound. In the figure to the right, three linkage groups are shown for loblolly pine, exhibiting markers of all types, including SNPs. The total loblolly pine map has in excess of 1,900 markers and a genome length of almost exactly 1,900 centimorgans, or one marker per centimorgan. The results of the high-throughput genotyping efforts in pine have truly been quite remarkable. Literally thousands of new markers representing many genes were made immediately available for study of associations, mapping, or for any of many other applications. We have spoken only briefly of the utility of genetic linkage maps. Of course, they provide a great deal of information about genome organization. Twenty years ago, we knew virtually nothing about how genomes were organized or how different they may be in related or unrelated taxa. Genetic maps have helped answer many of the questions once posed. This slide illustrates the util utility of genetic markers for conducting comparative genomic studies. You will recall in slide 10 of this module the two very primitive species maps created using allozyme markers and how we first gained insight into the potential synteny of gene location and order in the genomes of Loblolly and Jeffrey Pines. The more we learn from our increasingly dense maps, the more it appears that members of the genus Pinus have a very conserved genome. In this case, the markers used are all derived from expressed genes. Inconsistencies in map distances or order among markers may be real, or simple, simply reflections of poor precision in mapping due to too few progeny or low marker density. In yet another slide illustrating comparative genomics, we can see that gene order and linkage group location remain quite well conserved even across genera of the pine family. Thus, we know in the case of conifers Genome evolution appears to be very slow. Species known to have separated tens of millions of years ago look very similar at the genomic level. This linkage map was created for Chinese chestnut as part of an NSF-sponsored research project to build genomic tools for a group of related hardwood species. One of the goals of the project was to identify genes that were responsible for conferring resistance to the chestnut blight disease, which virtually eliminated the American chestnut tree from the forests of North America. 
This map, which is comprised predominantly of 1,191 SNP markers, was created in just a few months once the genetic sequence information was available. Over 65% of the markers on the map came from genes of known or suspected function. In this slide, we see another use of genetic maps. Of the 1,191 mark markers placed on the Chinese chestnut map shown in the previous slide, many of them represented genes known to be related to defense response in other species. These are candidate genes that may play a role in resistance to chestnut blight. By coupling this information with quantitative trait locus maps, which we will discuss at length in the next module, we can further narrow the number of markers or genes that could be of great utility in restoring our native species to natural ecosystems. The genes could be cloned and used in genetic engineering experiments, or markers for the genes could be used to assist in introgression breeding. As you may know, the first tree genome to be sequenced was a poplar. The figure shown here represents another application of genetic maps, the integration of physical maps, represented here by DNA sequence, and genetic maps. The assembled pieces of DNA sequence are called scaffolds. In this figure, there are 155 scaffolds aligned and oriented to a genetic map of the 19 populous linkage groups, ended here, indicated here by Roman numerals 1 to 19. Each scaffold, shown in yellow bars, was mapped to a chromosome, shown in blue bars, using mac microsatellite markers with unique sequence locations, indicated by red lines. Numbers in parentheses are estimates of the percent of the linkage group covered by assembled sequence, assuming uniform physical to genetic distance across the genome. Approximate size in kilobases is indicated to the right of each scaffold. Gaps between scaffolds are of unknown size. The integrated genetic and physical maps of poplar have provided an interesting look at genome organization in this angiosperm genus. You will recall from earlier slides that the conifers, which are many millions of years older, evolutionarily speaking, than angiosperm trees possessed rather well-conserved genomes with considerable synteny among all the linkage groups, even across genera. In this figure of the poplar genome, we see a very different picture. Poplar, like many angiosperms, is an ancient polyploid. That is, some or all of the genome was duplicated at least once. In this figure, the chromosome level reorganization of the most recent genome-wide duplication event in Poplis is illustrated using colors. Common colors refer to homologous genome blocks, presumed to have arisen from the salicoid-specific genome duplication 65 million years ago, shared by two chromosomes. Chromosomes are indicated by their linkage group number. The diagram to the left uses the same color coding and further illustrates the chimeric nature of most linkage groups. These large replicated segments share many genes in common, though over the years those genes may have evolved to have quite different functions. The final illustration in this module is that of a single linkage group in Douglas fir. As we have alluded to a number of times in earlier slides, genetic maps provide the framework for characterizing the genetic architecture of complex traits. This is done here by the alignment or mapping of quantitative trait loci for traits of interest. QTL mapping is the topic of discussion for our, our next module, but we mention it here not only as an enticement to continue, but to more completely demonstrate the utility of genetic maps. The salient point of this slide is that markers from known genes with known functions have been placed on the map and fall within the confidence limits of where QTL occur. This makes the gene a candidate and worthy of further investigation. 
In such a way, we can eventually learn about the function of each gene in each organism. How we use that information will be discussed in modules near the end of this course. We conclude this module with a quick summary of some of the important points of genetic mapping. The basic steps in creating maps are relatively straightforward. 1. Identify an appropriate segregating mapping population. 2. Obtain genotypes of parents and offspring for an appropriate number of genetic markers. 3. Format the genotypic data as required by your mapping software of choice. 4. Analyze the data and create the map. 5. Evaluate and interpret the output. And 6. Repeat the process to resolve issues that arise. As with most such processes, however, the devil is in the details, and great care must be given to address all the options offered by mapping software to fit your situation and data. As we have noted, not all markers are equivalent in terms of mapping value. Co-dominant markers are superior to dominant markers for most advanced applications of maps. Markers with more than two alleles can be fully informative for meiosis in both parents at the same time. Maps created for male and female parents may vary greatly due to parent-specific recombination rates or the number of informative markers, that is the level of heterozygosity, each possesses. Joining maps from each parent or from different crosses is feasible and may lead to a more complete and useful map. Map distance tends to increase with increased marker density and more markers allow for improved map functions for several applications, but not all. The resolution of your map is ultimately dependent on the number of progeny sampled. The appropriate number of markers and progeny in your study depends on your objectives and budget.